We're looking in the book of Numbers. Last week, we um, looked at the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that reminds us of the presence of God. So we need to remember that no, nowhere do we, at no point in life do we ever enter into any circumstances in our own power or our own strength. We may use only our own power and strength, but what's available to us, all of the power of God working in us. And the book of Numbers reveals to us the grace of God. Numbers was the idea of a census, the, how many people came out of the land and how many people were going to go into the, the promised land. But I always thought it'd be better to have been called the book of grumblings because it just seems like nothing changes, right? Vanessa and I, we've worked all over the world, Asia, and, and you know what? People, I mean, there are differences culturally, very strong differences culturally and diet and things like that. But you know, the basic human condition is the same wherever you go. We have a great capacity to forget what God has done for us. And when we face present circumstances that seem overwhelming, we can, we can even stop and grumble and say, like, you know, instead of saying, Lord, the, the God who provided water from a rock, or Lord, the God who provided manna from heaven, Lord, meet my need today. We say, what have you done? Have you brought us out here to die? <laughs> Isn't that kind of silly how we do that? But, but God is so patient with us and endures with us. And we see the grace of God in the, in the children of Israel's wandering in the wilderness. And I hope you see the amazing truth that God leads his people with grace even in their disobedience. Not that we are setting out to disobey, but, you know, think about it. If, if he got rid of us every time we disobeyed, who would be in here, right? It would be an empty building. But, but what God's grace does is his grace meets us in our disobedience. And his grace teaches us to say no to the life of obedience. But he never gives up on you, friends. I wish you could say that, you know, you, you walk with Jesus and then when you're 40 years old, you've reached the plateau and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So just hang on till you're 40. What do you think? Doesn't seem to work that way. Yes, I passed 50 and I'm on my way rapidly to 60. And I think, you know, you still need to depend on Jesus every day for his grace. He wanted to take the children out of Egypt from the land of bondage, and he wanted to take them with a very short journey into the promised land, but they were resistant, and unbelief kept them from entering in. And I was thinking about it. Was Isn't that kind of the same thing today? You read scripture, but faith keeps you from entering in. <laughs> unbelief, I'm sorry, a lack of faith, Unbelief keeps you from entering into the promises of God. So when God tells you you are who he says you are, you don't believe it because yeah, that sounds too good to be true. And what's he calling us to be a people who believe in him? In some ways, the promised land is a picture of the victorious Christian life. I, I, I know some authors point the, the, the promised land is kind of the picture of heaven, but man, there's still monsters in, in the promised land. I mean, there's still giants in their problem. There are still things that have to be overcome. In heaven, it's done. But he's saying to us, we can live in victory in the presence of our Lord. We can experience the victorious Christian life was simply Christ living in me and through me. And he wants to take you into that experience. But this is what I want you to think about. Are you choosing the wilderness through a heart of unbelief? Fear keeps us from entering the promises of God. This is the, maybe the, the enemy's chief strategic weapon is fear. Could it be that good? Could he love me that much? Because he knows that when he can captivate your heart and mind with fear, he can paralyze you into inaction. So hear his voice saying to you this morning, fear not. Fear not. Now let's look at numbers. This morning we're going to be in Numbers chapter 13. And let's look at beginning in verse number one through three, because we're going to look at the, the spies going into the promised land. And I called the, the message the minority report. 
the minority report. There was a movie about that, wasn't there? It was very different. The other, th the other thought was, my other thought on this title for this message was, the majority always gets it wrong. But then I thought, you, you are the majority and you might get mad at me. So we'll just stick with the minority report. Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send, me to sp send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. Now, so think about when scripture says things. He's giving an emphatic promise. I am giving it to the people. So there was never any doubt, was there? That was the promise. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. Well, Father, would you speak to us and show us what you have for us to learn from this lesson? And I pray that you'd fill your servant and anoint this message. And Lord, let it penetrate deep into the hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd work mightily in us and through us. Transform us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, he, he chooses one from each tribe. There's 12 spies. God had already led them through the wilderness to the borders of the promised land in a very short journey. This, this wasn't a 40-year journey. This was just... A, a, a number of days, really, where they could journey into the promised land. And he was ready to take them in. And so he commands Moses to send in representatives from each of the tribes to do what he says, to spy out the land and see for themselves if it was a land that he said it was. A land, what do we call it? The land of milk and honey. A land of great abundance. In grace, he was giving them Prove through experience that they could enter in. But we must remember what pleases God. What pleases God? Doesn't Hebrews tell us that faith pleases God? You know, we, we do get stuck in this uh, trap where we think, I need empirical evidence. Show me the proof and then I'll take action. But you know... God, God was giving him proof. God was letting him go in. Let him in. Go in and see what, what I've done. But he said, I'm giving this to you. It reminds me of the story when the disciples had seen Jesus feed multiple thousands of people with a few pieces of bread and fish. And they just seen this incredible miracle, just like Egypt, right? One stunning miracle beyond human explanation after another, and they come out of the, into, the, into the wilderness and they start complaining like they hadn't seen the 12. And the disciples get in the boat and they've just seen God do what only God can do. I mean, there's no explaining this, that there's more food left over than they started with. And they get out in that ocean, the, the, the sea, and the storm comes up. And these fishermen, I'm sure the first part of that fishing, uh, that, that trip, the, the fishermen were like, we got this, we got this, we've been out here before. And the storm came up, and the storm came up, and the storm kept building, and they ran out of fishermen tricks, and they finally came to the Lord who was sleeping soundly. But you remember the very beginning when they gave me, let's go to the other side. When God says, let's go to the other side, is the destination in doubt? But isn't that where we all get in trouble? Because it's the destination period where our transformation takes place. I resist all the storms and uncontrollable circumstances that come into my life. And you're all looking at me like with judging eyes. <laughs> What are you talking about? You resist them just as much as I do. There's nothing we don't like more than being out of control because we're all really God wannabes. Now, you wouldn't admit that, but it is. Ever since the garden, we've been sitting there going, listen, I could be like God, knowing good and evil. And what do we do? Spend all our time making judgments about everybody. 
which is what God does. So they get out there, and Jesus is sound asleep in the bottom of the boat, and in beautiful King James English, they say to the Lord, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Sounds better in King James English, doesn't it? You gotta admit it does. What happened? What, what, what happened between them seeing maybe 10,000 or more people fed with a few loaves and fishes to getting in? It was the present circumstances. And they were sitting there and they had circumstances that they couldn't control, they couldn't manipulate, they couldn't, they, they, they couldn't get themselves out of this thing and they forgot all of the promises and all of the hand of God and I think that happens to all of us. Look at verse 25 through 27. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and, all, and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. If you had time to go through each verse in it, you'd see they had a pole with, with grapes that they could barely carry. And they, what were they doing? Their first testimony is, well, yes, it is exactly as God said it is, a land flowing with abundance. That, the land was exactly as God told them. It, it was a land of abundance. But what we're going to see is that two different groups can go through the same experience, the same circumstances, and come away with completely different perspectives. If you've ever been in a church meeting, you'll know this is true, right? 12 guys go out, they see the same exact thing, they go through the same circumstances, and they have completely different perspectives and completely different conclusions. Some people prefer the predictability of the wilderness, right? They settle for the life that they can live under the illusion of being in control. And that's where most Christians live. They don't experience victory in their life. They just survive, but they would rather be in what they think is control. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. Because some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but I love this illusion. <laughs> if I could just get my spouse to cooperate in my illusion, we'd be good. <laughs> right? That's what it is. It's an illusion, friends. And we prefer the, the wilderness because we know it's predictable than walking into a land that God has promised a land of abundance. How many of you are living with the expectation of abundance? That God has an abundance for you. And this, don't limit this to some crazy TV preacher saying you're all gonna be billionaires. This, this abundance far exceeds just material possessions because you can have lots of material possessions and not experience abundance. But he says, listen, I have for you, the children of God, by faith, an abundance of righteousness, an abundance of justification, an abundance of all things of goodness and holiness. Yeah, yes, do we experience it all? No, because we tend to wander in the wilderness of unbelief. The flesh, the self-life, is appealing to some because they think they can control. But the wilderness, my friends, is full of heartache and confusion. One way is by faith and the promises of God, and the other is what's called by sight, simply what I can do. Perception is everything as we journey through life, whether it's faith or fear. I tell you, I, I, I write this message, and I, even last week and uh, you know, almost every week now, it's all kind of like what I'm dealing with. Am I, am I going to let the fear captivate me or am I going to have faith? For 30 something years, I've been serving the Lord full time and, and I've, I've always been on a diet. So why in the world am I all of a sudden now worried that somehow he won't provide for me? I don't know. 
You can explain it to me? Every day I got to choose faith over fear because the enemy will come to you and he comes to me and he will he'll fill your mind with all kinds of thought of fear. And he's saying, listen, listen, you, you don't want to stay in the wilderness, the, the place of confusion. Perception is everything as we journey through life. It's really all about your faith in the promises of God. Do you believe his promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you? You look at the life of Joseph and it's just incredible. How, how Joseph had this perception is just incredible. He, he, he experiences one heartache and one tragedy after another. And yet the scripture says, and yet the Lord God was with Joseph. You see, we get this idea that when God's with me, everything goes the way I think it should go. There's that God wannabe thing. Why would I be sick? Why would I lose my job? Why would this happen? Why would my kids rebel? Why would this? And we go through all of the whys and we are just not suited to be God to even understand the, quest, the answer to the question. And he said, will you go through by faith or will you go through by fear? Look at verse 28 and 29. However, now you know this is just like another way of saying but. And there, there could be a whole sermon on get your butt out of here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it because people use their butt all the time. They say, Pastor, that was a pretty good message, but... And that means everything they said beforehand does no longer applies, <laughs> right? You've had this happen. People some and they, 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 they kind of, uh, you know, say a, a few nice things and pleasantries and then they say, but, and what you know is they didn't mean anything that came before. <laughs> what they're really here for is this. That, yes, the land is full of abundance. Yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey. However, uh-oh. Whenever I get the but, whenever I get the however, I'm just like always oh, going, uh-oh, the hammer's about to fall, the shoe's about to drop. The people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, and besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Wow. Yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there's some monsters out there. The majority of the spies could only see the obstacles. <clears throat> And no doubt, these were wicked groups of people with horrible, vicious reputations, and there were giants among them. They were intimidating. They had already forgotten, however, the mighty, delivering hand of God from the land of Egypt. They had already forgotten that water flows from the rock when God speaks. They had already forgotten that manna falls from heaven in abundant provision when God orders it. They had already forgotten that they had been delivered by the mighty hand of God. What have you already forgotten? I don't know what you're facing. Right? Maybe you're facing divorce. Maybe you're facing abandonment. Maybe you're forcing, facing a job loss. Maybe you're facing bankruptcy. Maybe you're facing, you know, whatever. Illness, treatment. Have you forgotten? Because there's sometimes, you know, remember that old song, Bernard, uh, Count Your Blessings? Do you, ever, do you ever stop to count them? But he says, Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath 
done. The songwriter had it. Because if you don't stop and reflect, if you don't stop and count the blessings of God's abundance and pro provision and deliverance, the present circumstances will create fear and paralyze you from going forward. They were looking at the giants. They were looking at the obstacles as though they had been left to their own resources. They're saying, yeah, but there's this group here and that group there and this group here and that group there. And man, besides all of that, there's giants out there. When it was humanly impossible, God gave Abraham and Sarah a child, what the scripture calls the child of promise. Let me ask you this morning, what perspective are you embracing? In Christ, the scripture says what? We can do all things through him who strengthens us. So these giants, these overwhelming circumstances are just grand opportunities for God to reveal his mighty power and love. Do you see this all leading us to the place of abundance? When we cry out, Lord, I can't, who can? He lives in us. We are not alone. It doesn't mean there's nowhere in the scripture that we have a promise that somehow we're going to go through life and not have trials or difficulties, that there aren't going to be some giants in our life. But he says, I will go with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And everything that is out of my control is a grand opportunity for God to reveal his mighty love and power. Now, while the majority lost their perspective of God, Caleb knew God was with him. The majority saw giants and Caleb saw God. Where do you see giant? Where do you, what do you see? Do you see giants or do you see God? What's your circumstance? What circumstance do you find yourself in today in which you have no explanation of how you can get yourself out of it? And now is your eyes fixed on God or the circumstances? Are you seeing giants or God? So please, friends, don't submit to the faulty perspective of the majority. Look at verse 31 through 33. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And you know what? That might be true. You can face enemies that are stronger than you. You can face circumstances that you can't control. Absolutely. But look what he says in verse 32. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Nothing in their journey into the land gave any indication that any of this is true. But they're at the church business meeting and they're trying to make a point, and at this point, it's okay just to lie, because you got to make your point. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. Were all the people of great height? Who knows? There were definitely some people of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the son of Anak, who came from the Nephilim, which was the giant. And we seemed to ourselves like, what? Grasshoppers. <laughs> And so we seem to them. They gave a bad report. They generated fear and they ministered death. Now, Caleb, he was ready to lead the people to victory. He says, we shall surely overcome. They saw giants. Caleb saw God. If you measure yourself by your enemy, what are you always going to see? You're going to see yourself as a grasshopper. If you're measuring you by your enemy, you say, listen, I'm a grasshopper, but measure yourself by who you are in Christ. Measure your enemy by your God. 
Do you see how different it is? The giants can never overcome your Lord. And sometimes, frankly, friend, you just need to distance yourself from people who are only going to see grasshoppers. Who are only going to see the negative. Don't buy the lie from anyone that all you are is a grasshopper. The scripture says that you are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. This week, this last week, I was preaching in Florida Monday through Wednesday night in a, in a Bible conference. And, and the Lord gave me one night this verse, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, verse number 9. It's not, it's not in the slides. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you believe that? So why do we resist being weak? I mean, I can have anxiety attacks over being weak. What's that all about? Just me trying to resist what's obvious. And the, and the key isn't, isn't me getting stronger. The key is me embracing what it is. Letting it go, giving it to God, handing it over. Resisting all of my impulse to be a God wannabe. And just saying, Lord, I let go. It's yours. He said, but your, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, and this is the hard part. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let me ask you. Are you just okay with an anemic Christianity? I mean, haven't you been wandering in the wilderness for long enough? Somewhere between the land of bondage to sin and somewhere between the land of victory? You know, we judge Israel because they didn't get it, but I don't know. Has, has much changed? They spent all of those years wandering around in the wilderness short of the promises of God because of unbelief. And most of us go through our Christian life. And yes, we know that God has forgiven us and that heaven is our home. But that's some off distant place where we've yet to experience Christ as our life today. We're, we're so convinced of our arguments. We're so convinced of our reasoning. We're so convinced that we, we've kind of settled in for an anemic Christianity when the key is right here. Will you boast in your infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, upon you? And I don't know about where you're at, but I don't want to go through the rest of my Christian experience just as an anemic Christian who makes it through Faking it till I make it. You remember that one? I heard a preacher say that in church. Just fake it till you make it. <laughs> Boy, that's inspiring preaching. Fake it till you make it. And most of us come to church every Sunday. Faking it till we make it. <laughs> what a bunch of utter nonsense. Fake it till you make it. Nobody's really making it. I don't want to fake it. I don't want to pretend anymore. I want to experience the power of Christ resting on me. And if that means weakness, then let me boast in my weakness. Yes, I say boast in my infirmities. <laughs> boast. In, okay, Lord. You're, you're utterly nuts in my mind if you, th you say that with glee. Or, I mean, you're living on a higher plane than I've come to experience. But he says to, he says it over and over, rejoice in these things. Give thanks for all things. Why? Because at the end of our own resources, when we say we can't, when we see the giants, who comes in and manifests his power over and over for Israel through the wilderness to deliver them? And will he do it for you? Yes. Even if you have to force your lips to move. Boast in your infirmities that the power of Christ. Let's not settle for anything less than the full revelation of who God is in us and through us. 
I don't care what you know. Listen, we can stand around and have theological arguments till the mold grows. I don't care. I want to experience the power of Christ. I want the fruit of the Spirit to be evident in my life. I want people to experience love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control flowing through me. I want to experience in my weakness what I cannot experience in strength. In Christ Jesus, you, friend, you, the messed up you, the one who's come up short and is weak, the messed up, flawed, cracked clay jar that you are has become a partaker of the divine nature. That's you. And if you're here this morning and you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, what is he saying? He says, I not only live around you, I live in you. Personally, the Spirit of God comes upon you. And what is he saying? You are now partakers of the divine. That's right, you. For what purpose? That you might experience the power of Christ resting upon you. Forget about what you know better than someone else knows. Just say, Lord, I hunger to experience the fullness of your life. Give thanks to God for he causes you to triumph in Christ Jesus. You are no longer a grasshopper. You are no longer simply a sinner saved by grace. Does that mean you don't ever sin? No, my goodness, no. But that's not all you are. The scripture says, you know, it's just like a human being, right? The scripture says like 106 times he refers to the believer as a saint. And one time Paul says, I'm a sinner, chief of all sinners. So which one do we lock in on? One or the hundred? We lock in on the one. Why? Because it fits our experience. Because that's how we feel. But as long as you see yourself simply as a grasshopper, simply as a defeated foe, simply as a, I'm just a no good sinner. What are you going to do? You're going to live in sin. You're going to live in defeat. And he says, by faith, believe what I say, what I declare to be true, whether you experience or feel it or not. You are loved. Do you realize that you are loved when you feel it? Amen. But do you realize you're equally as loved when you don't feel loved at all? Because you're not the source of that love. He's the source of it. He said, listen, you can live the rest of your life in defeat, thinking you're no good, you're just a sinner, you're just a simple grasshopper surrounded by giants, but don't live there. In your weakness, in your failure, in your sin, if you will, come to Jesus and through faith believe that he has made you to be all that he desires of you, and you are now a super conqueror in Christ Jesus. Why would you live less than that? You are a saint, a giant slayer. You are just like David facing the giant with a sling. The battle is never us against the giants. The battle is not me against my illness. The battle is not you against your unemployment or your financial hardships. The battle is not you against the rejection you're experiencing in your relationships or a broken marriage or whatever it is that you're going through. Or the, it's never you against them. It's always God against the giants. The battle, the scripture says, is the Lord's. God could have wiped all of the giants out. God could have put a plague in to wipe all of the, the, the other tribes out before they walked in. He could have done it with a word, but he calls us to a life of faithfulness, a life of obedience. Look at Hebrews chapter number three, verse 16 through 19. For those, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of 
unbelief. Here's the deal, friends. Israel was led to the edge of the promised land and given the opportunity to enter in by faith, but they refused, they refused to believe that God was able. They saw giants and they saw overwhelming circumstances and you see them too. And you know, most of the time, let's just be honest, most of the time, the greatest obstacle in our life is not external to us, but internal. You know what I'm saying? People used to say, well, what's your greatest obstacle? Well, honestly, me. <laughs> what's your greatest obstacle? <laughs> it's not, it's, if you think it's still, you still think it's your spouse, man, wake up. <laughs> wake, wake up, man. That's, a, that's, a, that's an escape, man. That's not valid. You know, you, your, your spouse is not the great obstacle in your experience of wonderful life. You. you, you most of the giants, yes, the, the, most of the giants in my life are not external to me. Most of the giants are in my thinking, my sinful actions, my sinful attitudes, illness, whatever. And he's saying, listen, I want to slay those giants, but I slay them through belief. You say, well, I could be a saint if I could just quit sinning. What are you thinking? You really think that you're going to reach the state of perfection, that there is nothing that could be called sin in your life? I, I hope so. You might be pretty scary if you get to that conclusion. But what are we doing? We're coming to him and we're saying, Lord, man, I sinned. I blew it. I failed. But my behavior does not determine my identity. My present circumstances, the giants in my life, and you got giants and I got giants, these giants that are out here and all of these wicked tribes that are out there, he's saying, listen, we can enter in. Caleb says to them, let... We can go, we can conquer. Why? Because he saw, the sight, he saw everything in the sight of God. Faith isn't the absence of overwhelming circumstances. I don't know what yours are. I only know what mine are. I know what some of yours are. Sure, it was overwhelming and fearful. But remember, faith isn't the abs absence of fear but moving forward in the promises of God, believing in the power of God despite all the fear. We see this throughout the Bible. Moses, just a few years earlier, was negotiating with God because he stuttered. Right? He had a plan. Remember in the very beginning, he had a plan. He was working the plan. Things didn't work out the way he planned. And then, I mean, he knew what to say and he knew what to do. And then he spent 40 years with sheep pastoring sheep in the wilderness and then God comes to him okay now it's time I think you're broken down enough it's now it's time he goes no 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 but God used him God came to Gideon we're going to see I, I have a lesson I'm preparing on on Gideon I love Gideon well man what an exciting thing in the book of Judges Gideon, right? God comes to Gideon. What's Gideon doing? He's threshing out some wheat, hiding in the wheat in the wine press. He's inside the wine press, beating out wheat, trying to get some wheat. And God calls him and he says, Oh mighty man of valor. Like, oh, what? Are we saying the, are we seeing the same person? You see, you see your failures and you say, well, how could I be a saint? How could I be righteous? How could I be justified? How could, how could that be true of me? Because God doesn't see you limited to your behaviors and your attitudes. He sees you in who he has created you to be, even if you haven't experienced it all to that point. See, that's the difference. Faith, I enter in. I'm a saint, not because I'm saintly. I'm a saint because Jesus has put me on his altar, made me his possession, made me righteous, justified me, calls me holy even when I fail. Now, I don't know what that does for you. It doesn't make me want to fail more. 
makes me want to come and experience that I am all that he has called me. Yes, there's giants to be overcome. What's your giant? Health? Finances? Job? Insecurities? I don't know. Kids? Teenagers? I'm trying to think of all the many giants that are out there. Right? What's your giant? Is it you against the giant? Or God against the giant? And that's faith. Believing God has not left me to my own resources, but it's God in me against whatever comes against me. And in Christ, I am more than a conqueror. Can you believe that? Now, sometimes we say, Lord, I believe you've made me a super conqueror, more than a conqueror in Christ. Does that sound like I'm just a sinner saved by grace? Come on. That's how you feel, and sometimes that's how you act. But what does he say? He says, no, no, that's not just what you are. Yes, it's true. Sometimes you do that. But that's not who you are. You are in Christ a giant slayer. Through who? Through Christ. Are you ready to see yourself as a giant slayer? Or are you just going to fake it till you make it? What usually happens is we, it's not that we fake it till we make it, we just fake it till we quit. Right? I mean, I've met people over the last 30 years, man, I thought, man, this, is a, this, this, this person loves Jesus, man, they're, they're in, they're sold out, man. And then all of a sudden, they just walk away from the faith, and I'm like, what was that? Man? They were faking it till they made it. And instead, they faked it until they quit. You, friends, are not left to your own resources when facing the enemy, and you got it. Maybe it's employment, maybe it's health, maybe it's kids, maybe it's a spouse. I don't know what it is. I just know that everybody here is facing something unless you just quit, you just got over it and you're about to face something, right? Isn't that what they say? You either just, you're either in the trial of your life or you've just come out of the trial about to go into the next trial of your life. That's life. But you are not left to your own resources. It's never you against giant. It's Christ in you. Faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith isn't the absence of doubt, but moving forward in that doubt. Do you believe? Yes, Lord. I believe. But help mine unbelief. I love that passage because that's where I live. I believe. But them giants are scary. Help my unbelief. Father, thank you for these dear folks. I pray your blessings on them. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who has never entered in through faith into your finished work, that today they would know how deeply loved they are. Not because of anything they do or anything they have to give, but love because they're yours. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here this morning, you don't know that you've been forgiven. You don't know that you're deeply loved by God. You don't know that Jesus is your Savior. Would you say, Jesus, I receive your love? You say, yeah, but what about all my sins? He already dealt with your sin. Will you receive his love? Christians, try to remember you got to avoid the mob, even when it's a Christian mob. Because the majority almost always gets it wrong. It's not you against the giant. It's God against your giants. Father, we don't want to fake it till we make it. Father, we rejoice in our infirmities because we hunger and desire that the power of Christ may rest upon us.
In Jesus' name, amen.